friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa String Works Workshop with my second bridge removal for the day. <laughs> you know, so I'll be taking this bridge off on this guitar today. What kind of guitar is it? It's an Alvarez. And there's a look at the fretboard. And there's a look at the overall body. And there's a look at the back. Now the back's impressive. It looks really nice. But I know it's got to be plywood because you can't see this big V design on the inside. It's just straight wood on the inside and the grain doesn't match of course. So it's obviously a plywood back for sure. And I would assume that means it's a plywood sides also. Um, the top, uh, you know, I gotta be honest, I'm not sure what just, I hadn't looked at it that close before I turned the camera on, but let me look at the top here around the sound hole. I kind of think the top looks like it might be plywood as well. Yeah, I'd have to say it is based on what I'm seeing there. I would say that it's plywood as well. That's what I'm seeing. I, you know, I could be wrong on this. It's a model. Well, actually, it's got a, a number where the model is. It's The model is 5039, according to this. That's not a serial number, at least according to the tag that's in there. But it looks like a really nice guitar. It's just that the bridge is literally coming off of it. You can slide a piece of paper up under here. And, in fact, I'll slide a piece of paper up under there to show you that you can see the corner of that's going way up under there. And, uh, you know, and it's got one of those adjustable bridges, which are just junk. We're going to make a better bridge and put on this thing. Here we go. Well, I turned the bridge heater on a few minutes ago, and it's nearly up to temperature. It's up at about 350 degrees on its way to about 380. Once again, we're not going to save this bridge. We're going to make a new one that's non-adjustable. So I don't much care whether or not this bridge gets burnt or or anything else so I'm gonna heat it up extremely hot or at least as hot as I can get it to go in fact I think I may even turn up my thermostat here to about 400 I've got it at 395 that's close enough for now so that's a few more degrees hotter and I think that's a good thing because I just want to heat this up as warm as I can get it I'm gonna feel on the inside to see if I feel any heat coming through and I feel nothing yet so we'll show you where we're at here in just a few minutes well, it's been sitting about five minutes I reach inside here now and it's I can feel the heat in there pretty good so I'm gonna call that good for the moment I am gonna heat this up a little bit before I take the heater away this just gets the knife pretty warm so that it doesn't cool off the glue when I slide it under there. It doesn't take very long to heat up the knife either. The knife gets pretty hot pretty fast. In fact, the knife can actually damage the finish pretty easily because it's so warm. So you have to be very careful with that. Wow, that went under there easy. That's probably the easiest I've ever seen one go under. I mean like easy. Wow, that's really nice. Yeah, that extra heat probably made the difference. Although it's starting to get a little tight out at the ends. Now that's because I probably didn't have the heat out at the ends much. Okay, well good, that's working really good. So now I'll heat the ends a little bit more. Yeah, that went under there very easy. As a matter of fact, I don't recall one going any easier than that. I hope the rest of it goes that easy. It's basically off of there. i just trying to get it the rest of the way without breaking anything. Right here, we got a little tear out in the plywood here. But not too bad. There we go. Maybe we save that piece. A lot of glue there. They glued it right on. No, they didn't either. I, I was going to say they glued it right on top of the finish. They, they didn't do that, actually. They did glue it around the edges on the finish, but the center is not finished. But this is going to be a hard one to clean up. Most of the glue stayed on the top. It came off pretty clean on the backside. Really a lot of thick, heavy glue that just didn't get squeezed out, and that's probably the reason it came off. You know, as I've said before, you really want to clamp these things tight and squeeze out as much glue as possible. You know, a lot of people argue with me and say, you're going to squeeze, you know, starve the joint. I've been doing this for 40 years nearly, and I have never starved a joint in my life ever. And I squeeze them as tight as I can squeeze them. Really, honestly, don't recall one ever coming off. I truly don't. I've never had to redo one that I can remember. So anyway, the point is, this was not done well. They, they left the glue piled up here, and I mean, it's just piled up. It's, it's thick. And because of that, that's why it came off, in my opinion. 
It's going to be a lot of fun getting this thing cleaned off. There's some tear out here in the plywood. Not terrible. Um, easy, easily fixed. And I do have the one big piece that broke out. But it's not going to be easy to get rid of all this glue and all the junk that's on here. That's just glue. That big, thick piece. That's how they did not squeeze it together, as you can tell from that. Just, I mean, that piece of glue, let me, let's just, for fun, measure that to show you how thick of a glue joint they've got going on here. This is, this is really absolutely ridiculous and something to avoid if you're building an instrument. I mean, I just, you know, pointing it out here for a purpose. Yeah, that's 46 thousandths of an inch thick. That's one millimeter plus thick. That's ridiculous. So obviously that glue is going to fail because glue isn't strong like that. I mean, it, look at that. I mean, you can tell it's just not it's just not strong when it's that thick like that. Glue is really strong when you squeeze it almost completely out and it's just wood to wood with a very, very thin layer of glue. Then it's very strong. But a big thick layer like this, you ain't got a chance. I'm just gonna clean this up and I'm probably not gonna film it because it's basically, it's just chipping this all out of here and I'll just show you what it looks like after I get it all chipped out because it's gonna be a long process. You sometimes learn as you go on these things and on this one, I first said that they glued it to the wood, but they didn't. They did glue it to the finish. That was my first initial thought. I thought, yeah, they glued this to the finish. Then I thought, no, they did glue it to the wood and now I'm back to, yeah, I think they did glue it to the finish because the glue is peeling off the top of the finish here. The finish is staying on. You know, you can see the finish there. And, you know, it's just a mess. So I guess what I'm going to do is try to get all the loose glue off of here first. And then, and that's, that's the other reason it came loose, by the way, is because it had two big strikes against it from the very beginning. One of them was the thickness of the glue. They didn't squeeze it out tight enough. And the second one was gluing it over the finish. That is never going to hold. I mean, it'll hold for a while, but it'll never hold permanently. So that's why this one failed. Once I get this relatively cleaned off, then we'll make us a new bridge. Uh, put it on here, do the intonation test, and then we'll mark it and clean off every bit of the finish. I think I'm going to make this bridge out of cherry, and the reason is this is some, I don't know, this is not necessarily a domestic wood, but I, it's definitely not a heavy rosewood or ebony or anything like that either. It's, it's a very, it's a hardwood, but it's a very light hardwood. I don't know what it is. So I feel like the cherry it will be at least as good as this. Now the color difference, obviously, but we can, we can dye it and that shouldn't be a problem. So I believe that's what I, I'm gonna make it out of. I have some real rosewood and things to use, but I hesitate using it on this guitar because I really think we got some issues with this plywood separation and all this stuff here. I just don't think it's the right material to use on this guitar. I think the cherry will actually bond better too. So that's why I'm gonna use it. I got my thicker lead mechanical pencil here and I'm tracing around this. I've left a little tiny lip on the front just for oversize and now I've got the thicker lip lead and I'll, I'll leave the lead and so I'll have a slightly bigger outside edge here too. So I'm just making it just very slightly oversized is what it boils down to. Okay, we're going to cut out the bridge profile now. Well, in hindsight, I kind of wish I would have looked closer at this bridge. Did you notice that this hump doesn't match that hump at all? And I, it's real obvious on this one where I've got it where it's cleaner and, you know, you can see this hump goes up higher and this hump's lower and it's spread out more. This one's not. What a bummer. I wish I'd have noticed that ahead of time. I would have tried to make them match and make it a little bit bigger. But on the other hand, that's the way it came from the factory. So I guess we'll put it back that way. We're going to thin this down to the thickness of the other bridge. Now we just need to taper off the ends like the other bridge was tapered. 
I put marks on here so I wouldn't get confused and take it off the wrong side. And the reason it matters is because this hump is different size than that. And so I want to match it back to the top uh, in the same way. But anyway, we're going to uh, start taking that off. It's late in the day. I think I'm gonna stop there for right now, but that looks pretty good. We're gonna to need to round off a little bit, uh, just, you know, get rid of some of the squareness, but otherwise we're in pretty good shape. It's the next day and I left off with this uh, bridge in this shape right here. I might just address a question that I have received before on making these kinds of bridges, and that is, why don't you just buy a replacement bridge? Why do you make one that just takes so long to make one? Well, first of all, it doesn't take me very long to make one. It only took a few minutes to make this. You know, if I ordered it, I would, I would probably spend almost as much time on, on the phone ordering it or online ordering it as it took me to make it. So that's the first issue. Second issue, is that I would you'd never get one that matches as you can see clearly see in this this hump doesn't match that hump so obviously you know if you ordered one even if you could find one that would sort of simulate this it wouldn't match exactly anyway the holes probably wouldn't match so by me making one, I can make everything match up the way I want it to. Now I can align these holes with this, uh, with this here using it as my template. I can line these holes and then the holes will line up again. I can set this bridge on here, glue it in place by those holes, then custom cut the new saddle slot. So it'll be perfect when we're done versus that mess. Um, so that's why I do it. And you know, you can make your case the other way, I'm sure. You know, you could make the case that this particular guitar is being a plywood type guitar is probably not worth all this effort. But on the other hand, it was worth it to that customer to bring it here. So in my opinion, it's worth fixing. He wants it fixed or she wants it fixed in this case, I think. So be that as it may, we're going to fix it. So what I'm going to do now is line this up very carefully and draw these holes on here to the best of my ability. I have my fine point mechanical pencil here, which I really like this thing. I've about given up on regular pencils because constantly breaking the lead, constantly running to sharpen them. I've got these mechanical pencils now in different size leads and uh, they just work really well. I'm pretty happy with them. So see if I can draw the, it's going to go back through one more time, trying to make sure I really get it marked well. And that did a nice job. So I can go over to the drill press now and drill these out. Shout out to all my friends out there in millimeter land. I'm using a five millimeter drill right here to drill these holes. Got my close-up glasses on so that I can really pay attention and try to get them exact. Well, that's probably as close as it needs to be and it looks good and clean and the holes on the back side are pretty clean because I used a backer board. In fact, I see one that I didn't quite go all the way through. I'm gonna go back through it again. Now they look real good. Even the back side looks real clean. Just the teeniest bit of a tear out, but that won't hurt anything. Now we're going to go do a little bit more hand touch up on this and get her glued in place. I have the bridge located temporarily uh, with a clamp holding it in place so it doesn't move around because we have to trace around this and cut all that old finish and glue and all that junk out of there. It's mostly finish at this point. I've got most of the glue off of it already. And I had to get the glue off of it first just so it would set flat because the glue was so piled up it was ridiculous. This is always a little tedious. If you ever do this, you want to be very careful that you stay against your pattern because it's very easy to, for this blade to want to wander out. In fact, what I do to keep it from wandering out, I actually tilt the blade in just a little bit to the direction I'm cutting and that helps keep it from wandering. The other thing is you don't want to cut too deep. If you cut down where you're cutting real deep into the wood fiber, then you're gonna have the bridge is not going to be very strong anyway because the wood fiber will tear out. So you just want to cut through the finish and not much deeper than that. Okay, I think we're in pretty good shape on the three sides. Now we just got to go across the front and I think we're good. Perfect. I believe that'll do it. We're going to have our work cut out for us on this one. I can tell you that uh, plywood, I it's, it's wanting to peel really badly. 
Uh, so it's going to be very difficult to get the glue off of this without taking the plywood off. I'm not looking forward to it at all. If I could think of a good way to get that glue off, I'd do it. it well, actually, it, yeah, I keep calling it glue, but I think there's a, a little bit of a glue and it's mostly finish. Well, if I could think of a good way to get it off of there, I would sure do it because uh, my normal method of peeling it off in this case is going to grab all of this uh, plywood. And I've been wrong before. No, it's grabbing it. Yeah, this, this plywood veneer, it just wants to peel off of there really easy. I'm just going to have to be very careful about it and just, you know, as they say, get her done. And that's what I'm going to do. It seems if I go across the grain instead of with it, it's not peeling as bad. Found that out pretty quickly here, so that's what I'm doing. I'm kind of 45 and across the grain rather than one way or the other. You can't go this way and you can't go that way without catching the grain, but you can 45 it, it looks like. So that's what I'll do. That's working pretty well. May not take too long this way. You can see I've cleaned a pretty good area right in there. A lot to do, so I'm not going to film any more of it. I'll just clean it off and show you. But like I said, I'm going at a 45 to the grain. Well, my old buddy from Millimeter Land, Colin, sent me this uh, little uh, tiny belt sander. It's a very handy tool on a lot of things. I did a little test run here, and it seems to work pretty good on getting rid of this finish. With And, of course, it won't tear anything out. So I'm going to at least get the bulk of it out with this, I believe. Now, it's very dusty, I can tell, so I'm going to put on my dust mask, and then we'll get to it. Well, that made very short work of that, at least I think it did. I see a little bit right there yet, and of course on the very end there, I didn't get that, and right around the edges, you can't get that close, but I think I just gotta touch up that, well, two, looks like two spots, right there and right here, and then we're done on that. Well, I think that saved probably 15, 20 minutes worth of work right there. We'll clean that up. I've carefully gone around the whole thing, and I believe I've got it cleaned off really well and it even kind of sits in there now where it shouldn't move. The holes are look like they're perfectly aligned to me. Everything looks really good. The only slight negative is there was some tear out and I did save it. Uh, at least I think I did. Yeah, here it is. It came out of right there. Now the negative is it's got a lot of finish on it, but I think I can get it back in there if I can get the finish off of it. We could just glue it in, clamp this all down, and we're good to go. But I'd like to get that finish off of it first, if I could. And I don't know if I can pick that off or if I'll have to go back to the sander again. I think I'm going to have to go back to the sander. Don't know if I can hold that. You know, it it's kind of holding itself in place. If I can hold it and then maybe sand the rest of that off of there. It's kind of a tedious little thing and some people would say, well, why don't you do it off of the guitar? It's it's just the fact that the, the slot there helps hold it and, and I don't have any other way to hold it. That worked just like I knew what I was doing. And of course, I didn't know what I was doing, but it worked that good. Well, I say that. Now here I see I got off a little bit out of my line. Doggone it. We can put a drop of finish there and, and fix that. But uh, yeah, I did I did move a little bit more. I, I just thought I stayed within that line, no problem. But I, I can see I didn't. There you go. That's what I get for thinking. But it's not that bad. We can touch, like I said, put a little drop of finish right there and everything's good. At least we got the hole filled. Well, it's all good. We're ready to glue it in place. We're going to have to get glue underneath all these little loose parts right here. I don't think that'll be too much of a problem. This one here is out of there, so I'll just start right there. I'm forcing glue back under those loose places. I'm going to lift it up and get glue back under there. Pretty sure that's good. Smear the glue around here. Get glue on the back side of this one here that's came out, and we'll put it in place. Yep, it went down in there perfectly. All right, now we're good. We can get the glue on the rest of this, and I think we're good to go. As I've said many times, this is not the place to get in a hurry. Make sure you get 100% coverage, not 99.9, 100. You're better off changing your brush strokes around, going different directions. Just take your time and get glue on there really well. Same way with this. You don't need a ton of glue. You just want 100% coverage. In fact, less is more. Just 
a thin coating of glue is all you really want, but you want 100% coverage. All right, we've got it. Now we got to put it in place. Line up those holes. Sometimes, you know, the end of a paintbrush is really handy for lining up these holes if you can find the right size paintbrush. I think I found one here that'll be just about perfect. That really is nice. That lined it up really well. Then I've got my call with the paper here, the wax paper. We'll put that on the inside. And again, this is always the trickiest part to me, trying to do it and, you know, keep the paper there. I had glue on my fingers, so everything was sticking to me. There we go. I think we got it that time. Getting the clamp in here with your big arm in there is the hardest thing. That is the hardest thing. If you get that first one and get in the get the call held in place, it's not too bad. That first one is the tricky one. Okay, and then you can get your arm out, make your final adjustments to your bridge, make sure it's in your slot really good. Everything looks perfect to me. Tighten it up just a little bit more. Always take my mirror on the inside because you don't know what happened to your call. You think it's right, but sometimes they're just not. That one looks pretty good this time. Yeah, I think we're good this time. So let's get the other clamps in place. Again, this is that one clamp that just doesn't open up as far. I don't know if I can even get it on this time. There it is. There it is. Just barely is big enough with that call that's in there. Perfect. And some people say you don't need these three clamps. I say you don't use them. That's your privilege. I will always use them. One just doesn't cut it in my book. Again, you get real good even squeeze out that way. It also helps pull the hump out of the guitar by having the three clamps on there with the call under there. It just is a lot better deal. Very even squeeze out all the way around. I think you can see perfectly fine. Now we'll clean that up. You don't need to see me cleaning it up, but that's the next step. That's what she looks like all glued up. And yes, it did occur to me that I got my course in front of the card again. I could have stained this dark before I glued it on. It would have made it a little bit easier. But you know, on the other hand, you know, when you're wiping this water around here, it changes the stain too. So, you know, it's six and one half, half dozen in the other on, on the way you do it. My hand's pretty steady. I can stain it now and it won't be a problem. So we'll give this 24 hours to set up and dry and then we'll see where we go from there. I took the clamps off of this. It's been sitting several hours and uh, so it's pretty dry. I thought I would go ahead and do some contouring on this and shaping it. Um, I did some sanding on it and stuff, but it just, it still just never got really where I wanted it to go. I just take this, uh, little finger plane and I, I'm real good with using that and I can shape it much faster anyway with the finger plane. The idea is to round it off so there's no sharpness. By leaving this just a little bit stouter I was able to pull a lot of that bow out of this too. There was quite a bit of bow in this and you know theirs was much thinner down in here. I'm leaving this one a little bit thicker on purpose because that just helps keep it flat. Instead of this, all of it would contour easily by this being so thin. With this being a little stiffer, then it all has to stay a little flatter because of this. Okay, that's probably good enough. The holes have filled in with glue, so I'm going to re-drill those. Well, once again, I've already started. I didn't turn the camera on, but that's okay. You just, you know what it's like to drill a hole. One more to go. I already got the other ones, so we're in good shape there. I have tried many, many different things to uh, bevel out these holes, and everything I try, I, I have tried every kind of, uh, you know, uh, countersink type bit you can think of, and nothing seems to cut them clean, or they chatter, or there's some problem. This seems to cut them fairly cleanly, and, you know, I say that now doing it on camera, of course, you know, there's always that risk, but it's always cut them very clean in the past, and so that's what I'm going to use. Yeah, it just does a nice clean job.
can, I think you can see how nice and clean the job is. It, it, there's no tear out, there's no chatter, it just does a nice job. Everything else I've ever tried has just given me fits. I've even tried other larger drill bits even. You know, I've tried a, a zillion things. This just seems to work the best. The next thing I was doing was testing the fit of these pins. The first one fit like this, and you can see it doesn't go down all the way, and you can't have that. This one you can see goes all the way in, and what I'm doing is I take in the reamer, and I just ream the hole until I can feel the reamer in right at my fingertip. And as soon as I feel it, I stop, and that should get them all about the same depth. There it is right there, and that one should go in now too. You know, perfect. You have to clean the uh, reamer out every once in a while. <sighs> okay, two more to go. Okay, they should all be fine. Now, uh, to be perfectly honest with you, that kind of messed up my bevel, so I'm gonna put a new bevel on those. Just a new bevel with this. Should have waited, but I didn't. That made them really nice. Hopefully you can see it. There's two more steps. I'm going to sand this smooth and then I'm going to dye this and let it set overnight. You know, the fact that we just glued this today, uh, I think it's a good idea to wait at least 24 hours before you string it up. Hopefully you can see how nice that turned out. Really smooth and pretty. Now we'll dye it um, with the dark brown which should make it match this pretty closely. So there you go, you can see, turn it a nice color there. And I think it's gonna be pretty close to the color that we have. I'll, I'll go down in these holes and circle around a little bit because it's hard to get the dye to go all through the whole thing. Okay, that looks real nice. Now the trick is getting the dye around the edges without making a mess. Like I said, it would have been better to have done this before, but then there's so many other processes that it ends up messing up the dye anyway, so you just almost as well to do it this way. Well, I think that's pretty darn good. You know, as I always say, it could always be a little bit better, but it's pretty darn good. I do see some darn glue that got on the top of this bridge up here. So I'm gonna scrape that off, because that won't die right. Didn't see it till just now. Looks like there might be a little bit right there too, and even a little bit right there. So, you just re-sand it and re-dye it and you can't tell it. When you dye it, you can see the scratches better, so I'm gonna go ahead and sand the whole thing a little bit more and get rid of a few more scratches. They're not real bad, but you can see them. In the bare wood, I couldn't see them, but once I dyed it, I could see the scratches. Just wiping off the excess and we'll let that dry overnight and then we will uh, put linseed oil over it and that will kind of lock the dye in where it doesn't keep coming off. And we should be good to go to string this thing up tomorrow. It's been several days and I'm back to the Alvarez. I was getting ready to try to do my intonation trick uh, with the little hanger, but there's no end pin in this. Now I just happen to have a bunch of these end pins in stock. So I thought, well, I'll just use that. That's kind of what it's designed for. And it looks like it's gonna fit nice and tight. So I'm just gonna bop it in there and he can keep that as part of the guitar then. And uh, I believe it's I believe it's seated and I don't think you could pull that out. We'll just anchor off of that to set the intonation. We've got the guitar rigged for the intonation test and I believe the intonation's very good. Hopefully you can see the tuner there. There's open, right dead center, right dead center.
dead center again both ways. So I have the saddle then exactly where I want it. Now just for your reference, if it's on when it's open, but when you note it, it's sharp, that means this distance between here and here is too short. So you need to slide it back a little bit. On a little bit makes a difference. So I mean like just a tiny bit. And then, um, you know, if it's if it's flat, well then the, the way I remember it is flat means it's too far back. Flat, far back, you know, sharp is short. That's the way I remember. So this is too short if the note is sharp, and this is too far back if the note is flat. And that's when you're noting it at the 12th fret. That's how I remember it. There's all kinds of little rhymes and things people use to remember it. But uh, anyway, that looks like it's perfect to me, so I'm going to mark that. Then we're going to be cutting that slot. I like to mark both sides of it, and really marking it right at the string is the best place to mark it, and just draw a straight line across it instead of trying to mark it with the saddle itself. That saddle there is probably not perfectly straight. That's what we'll do, and then we'll set up for routing that out. I've taken a straight edge and I've drawn the two straight lines across this way. Now I'm just taking a little square and I'm going five millimeters past the hole, past the edge of the hole, and I'm going to draw that as the stopping point. And I'll do the same thing on this side and I'll go five millimeters past that and we'll draw that as the stopping point on this side. So we, we want to route a slot between here and here. I'll set up for that now. Now that I've decided to use this for all my uh, base routing applications, I had to make some major modifications to this. I did those off camera, but you know, basically it amounted to routing out a channel underneath this so that it would slide over the bridge a little bit better. I needed to be able to go that way. This base is not as large, so I needed to move the whole rig this way. So I just did some routing under the plastic here that you can't really see, and that allows this piece to slide over the back part of the bridge. That gets me close enough. I've adjusted this to cut 50 thousandths deep first, and I've got everything aligned and everything tightens, so we should be good to go. We'll give it our first shot and see what happens. Double checking to make sure it's still aligned properly. I gotta be honest, it doesn't look right. I may have turned it around from one side to the other in aligning this thing. Yeah, something's not right. Looks okay there. I think it's, it's the tipping thing here that I'm dealing with. It looks okay. I'm just gonna have to be very careful when I insert it into the wood. Here we go. Well, that looks perfect. Looks really good. Okay, I'm gonna drop it down another 50 thousandths or so, and we'll cut it again. We're ready for pass number two, and we'll see if we can make it go as well. Looks really good. Can't tell what the camera can see there, but I think you can see the slot. I'm going to measure the depth of that slot and see how deep we are. 180 thousandths. I think I'm gonna drop it down a little bit more. Hopefully this will be the final pass. That looks real good. I think the depth is, is real good. I like to go through, you know, about three quarters of the depth of the bridge, something like that, and I think we're pretty close to that right there. So now we just gotta make a saddle, and I think we're ready to string this baby up. As you can see, I have the antler saddle cut for this and inserted, and as I pretty much always do, I take and draw a fine line right against the seam there where the uh, bridge top is. And I, I do that so that I can tell if it's going in the full depth and if it's going in an even depth. And I think you can probably see there that it is going in the full even depth there. You know, I like to see a good depth holds the thing solid so it doesn't rock. That makes good contact with the top of the guitar too, the deeper you go like that, rather than being muffled through the whole entire bridge. So, now that we know that it's in there well, and I'm just gonna guesstimate this part, just by eye, I'm just going to draw a line in here and just kind of a, a ballpark line. It's gonna be a little high probably, but that just kind of gives me something to shoot for as I go grinding this off, and we'll go to the grinder and cut that off. Actually, I'll probably go to the bandsaw first and knock off the biggest chunk, and then we'll go to the uh, sander. For these guitar saddles, I've got this angle set at approximately 12 degrees, and I'm cutting off the back side of the saddle. In other words, going back, sloping down toward the pins. 
And I just do that radius by eye. I've been doing it for so long that I've pretty much got that fixed into my brain. But I believe that's going to make an excellent saddle. Before I put the saddle in there and string this up, I'm going to rub some linseed oil on this, boiled linseed oil. That'll do two things. It'll help seal the wood up a little bit, but it also keeps that dye from rubbing off. It makes the dye much more permanent. Doesn't take very much of this. This is going to soak in pretty good because it's, you know, uh, a raw piece of uh, wood, but it sure makes it look nicer too. So I'm just going to rub it a couple minutes. I haven't done any kind of a fret job on this guitar, and it may or may not need one. Yeah, it probably does need a little bit of work, but it doesn't look too bad. Let's go ahead and just clean up the fretboard with that a little bit. I think, I think I'm just going to go with it like it is at first, and we'll see if it needs a fret job. Um, you know, I don't honestly know if it needs that or not. It kind of looks like it's on the borderline, but I don't, you know, I don't want to run up the price on this because I had kind of committed to a certain amount of time on this one, and I don't want to go over the time time limit. Just going to put the two E strings on the guitar at first, just to check the saddle height. These are the same two E strings that I put on it when I was setting the intonation or checking the intonation. Get these up to pitch and then we'll check the action. Got my incise uh, bevel gauge here. I guess that's what I'd call it. It takes a little practice to get used to using this. You gotta make sure you get it level on the fret there. Right at 130 thousandths here, which I knew it was gonna be very high, so that doesn't surprise me. 130 thousandths there, and this side's not so bad. In fact, this side's, according to this, looks like it's only about 90 thousandths, so that's that's just about right. I'm gonna double check it again. Yeah, 90 thousandths is tight, so it's right at 90 thousandths. We could stand to drop this just a little bit. We could stand to drop this 10 thousandths. We're gonna take 20 thousandths off of here. We're about 40 thousandths high here, so we're going to take about 80 thousandths hot off of this side. Let me double check that so I don't screw up. 130 thousandths, so we want to drop this by about 40 thousandths. So that means we'll take 80 thousandths here and 20 thousandths here. So that's what we're going to do. I set the calipers at 80 thousandths, and that'll be on the base side. I can actually see the mark here even without putting the black on it, I think. Well, I could, but now I can't. So I'll go ahead and put the black on there. Just makes it a little easier to see it. Okay, we'll scratch off the 80 thousandths. And now we're gonna scratch off 20 thousandths on the other side. And that's very minor. It's so minimal, it's hard to explain. Okay, you'll never see this probably. You can probably see this scratch in the middle of the black there. And then we're gonna take off to almost nothing on this side. I can anticipate the next problem being that the string angle from the hole to this is gonna be uh, low on this on the base side especially. This particular bridge is going in um, where the base is actually a little lower than the treble, which is unusual, but not un totally uncommon either. And I'm just gonna go ahead and cut a little bit of a slot here so that the string will go down in there a little bit better and get a little more angle. And we'll need to uh, touch this back up with the uh, die again. That should work fine. Now we'll get the die out and touch that back up. Now the string action ought to be real good. Let's put the strings back on it and test it out. Well, I got fooled that time. I need to take more off of this. The action's still kinda high. Still about 20 thousandths high all the way across. So I need to take 40 thousandths all the way across on this. I don't know how that turned out that way, but it did. That's what we're going to do to fix it. And it may be because we got all the six strings on there now, and it's maybe it's even pulling the top up a little bit. You know, I don't know. But anyway, it is a little higher than it ought to be, so we're gonna take this down a little bit more. Because I had to lower this another 40 thousandths, that's even even making this angle a little worse. So I'm going to use the Dremel. When I use these for pulling pins, I don't squeeze. I just get under there and lift. And that's all you have to do. You don't need to squeeze it or anything because you'd make a mess and break the pin. My motto is anything worth doing is worth doing three or four times. That's at least the second or third time there. Now we gotta get out the die and do that again. Like I said, don't just do it once, do it two or three times if you can. That looks 
Perfect. Now we'll try it one more time and hopefully for the last time. Victory, my friends, victory. It's 90 thousandths on this side and 80 uh, thousandths on that side. That's as perfect as they get. Um, you can see that the string angle coming over the bridge is just about perfect, I believe. It's got nice angle and, and the base side was the one I was really worried about, but I think you can see there's plenty of angle there coming from the peg up to the saddle. A person could argue and say you should take the whole bridge down rather than cutting those slots. But the problem with that is if you've got a guitar that already has a slight bulge like this, you're weakening the bridge. That doesn't give you the strength to keep it flat. That will actually cause it to bow more. So you're better off leaving your bridge thicker, cutting those slots in a situation like this. And, you know, especially on this particular guitar. Now, if this was a very high-end guitar, we might have attacked it a different way. And, you know, the fact that I was also limited to try to keep this below five hours of my time, um, you know, for the whole thing. And that includes making the bridge and the saddle and everything. So, you know, I couldn't go as deep as I wanted to, but on the other hand, I went as deep as I could go. I uh, don't really feel like it does need a fret job. It, the frets seem to be fine. It plays good without buzzing. And we'll play it for you now and show you what it sounds like. So here's what it sounds like after all that work. Got a nice tone. Pretty even across the strings very clear. If you'd like to hear me play and sing a song on this, I'll put that in a separate video that you can see. It'll have the same number with an S after it. Thank you very much for watching the video. I hope you found it helpful and I would appreciate a thumbs up if you don't mind. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, be sure to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you.